Welcome everybody to a uh, Jack uh, video interview on a very exciting uh, paper that is being published at Jack called Terzepatide Reduces LV Mass and Pericardiac Adipose Tissue in Obesity-Related Heart Failure, the Summit CMR Substudy. Um, I am Neha Pagadipati. I'm a preventive cardiologist at Duke, and I have the privilege of being an associate editor at Jack as well. And today I'm very excited to be joined by the lead author of this uh, summit substudy, uh, Dr. Chris Kramer. Dr. Kramer, could you um, briefly introduce yourself? Sure. I'm the chief of the cardiovascular division at the University of Virginia and vice president of the American College of Cardiology. Great to be with you today. Wonderful. Well, we'll get right into it because this is, you know, the hottest topic. Um, and so we're very excited to discuss this paper and we're so privileged to have been able to publish it in Jack. I was hoping that maybe we could start with a brief overview of the parent trial, the summit trial, so that people have a context of what this um, MRI sub-study was. Could you walk us through um, what the summit uh, trial was and, and what it showed? Sure. The, the summit trial is a, a trial in obesity-related uh, HEFPEF, uh, and so it was uh, a trial of men or women uh, older than 40 with uh, chronic heart failure, EF more than 50, and a BMI uh, greater than equal to 30, and then some associated findings that increased their the likelihood they had uh, he true HEFPEF with left atrial enlargement or filling increased filling pressures or high BNPs. And there was enrichment criteria, including uh, reduced walk distance and, and abnormal KCCQ scores less than 80, et cetera. So it was enriched HEFPEF study of 731 patients that were randomized uh, to terzepatide in, in increasing doses uh, up to uh, a, a maximum of 15 milligrams per week. Uh, and they were treated uh, double blind uh, therapy for up to three years or the median duration of follow-up of, of two years uh, in the main parent trial. And uh, the uh, main, the, the principal endpoint, uh, primary endpoint of this study was uh, cardiovascular death or worsening heart failure. And the study met its primary endpoint, and that paper is uh, presented at the AHA as a late-breaking trial and, and published simultaneously at, at New England Journal of Medicine. And that uh, the hazard ratio for uh, cardiovascular death or worsening heart failure was 0 0.62. So it was a reduction of 8.8 .8 events per 100 patient years in the placebo group to 5.5 .5 events per 100 patient years in the tercepatide group. So uh, uh, highly uh, statistically significant. So in that context, of course, everybody's next question is why? <laughs> How does trisepatide do this? And um, and that's exactly what your um, what this study begins to address. And so I, you know, in this sub study, you looked specifically at changes in LV, LV mass and epicardial and pericardiac tissue. For those of us who are not experts um, in this area, could you tell us a little bit more about why you decided to look at epicardial pericardiac tissue, what the difference is between those and why those could be clinically important? Yeah, let me start just by saying that I, the, the ep epicardial and pericardial adipose tissue were secondary endpoints. The primary endpoint was a reduction in LV mass. And uh, uh, and so the the pericardial adipose tissue were, were secondary endpoints. You know, HEFPEF is a, a, a disease of, uh, uh, of excess, if in many patients with HEFPEF, excess uh, adip adipocytes. There's uh, increased uh, synthesis of adipocytokines and they have uh, anti-natriuretic effects and pro-inflammatory effects. So there's that leads to volume expansion, myocardial inflammation, increased LV mass, et cetera. And that leads to uh, increased LV filling, increased volumes, and the inability of the left ventricle to tolerate uh, those increased volumes due to the increased LV mass and diastolic dysfunction. So, so that's the state of uh, of HEFPEF. So there's increased fat around the heart. They re it releases cytokines. There's some thought that epicardial fat may uh, reduce relaxation of the heart, sort of uh, as sort of a pericardial tether in, in, in a sense. And so those are the, the that's the thinking behind uh, the effect of, of 
uh, epicardial and pericardial fat. So just to point out the difference, epicardial fat is the fat between the epicardium and the visceral pericardium. Uh, and then there's pericardial fat that's external to the visceral pericardium. And that's a visceral type of fat, different than epicardial fat. As it turns out in the in our study, the, 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 the uh, CMR sub-study, there was four times as much pericardial fat as epicardial fat in these patients. So that's the majority of the adipose tissue in patients with obesity-related HFPEF. It's, it's pericardial fat, not epicardial fat. Well, we we've spoken for years about EAT, EAT, EAT. That turns out to be the minority of the adipose tissue in patients with HFPEF. Fascinating. And so in the study that you just published, you had 106 patients that had both baseline and follow-up MR um, MR evaluations, and um, and and you know some were in the trisepatide group, some were in the placebo group, and you did find an impact on both the primary outcome of LV mass as well as the pericardiac um, adipose tissue. Could you walk us through what you thought the most salient um, and and clinically relevant findings were from this sub study? Yeah, so uh, you're you're right. We had 106 patients that were uh, that had complete data at baseline in 52 weeks. So the the CMR sub study was a one year stu study. The the parent study was longer. The CMR study was was baseline at 52 weeks. We had uh, we actually recruited 175 patients, so about a quarter of the total summit population into the study. Uh, but only 106 of the 175 ended up with complete data. There were some the the sites were were mostly Latin American sites, and there was they weren't necessarily expert in CMR, and so there was some incomplete data sets, some uh, incomplete data. Some uh, obese patients are harder to image than uh, uh, non-obese patients, and so there was some some loss of patient, and there were some patients with interval events. We ended with 106, uh, 50 in the tercepatide uh, group, and 56 in the placebo group. At baseline, the patients had ele elevated LV mass and LV volumes, if you left atrial volume as well, if you compare them to uh, normal volunteers, we don't age matched patients from the literature. Obviously, we didn't have volunteers in this particular study, but if you compare the baseline LV mass and, and, and volumes, it's, it was higher in this group. In the, in the study, terzepatide was associated with a significant reduction in LV mass uh, when corrected for the uh, placebo uh, uh, group. So the, 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 uh, it was a total decrease of 11 grams. That was at a starting uh, mass of 120 grams. So it's almost a you know 10% reduction in LV mass, so uh, highly significant, whereas there was no change in the placebo group. In addition, we we summed the epicardial and pericardial adipose tissue and called it paracardiac adipose tissue. So the sum, there was a 45 milliliter drop when placebo corrected in the tercepatide treated group. That was at from a starting uh, value in the 220. So about a 20 to 25 percent reduction in uh, pericardiac adipose tissue, most of that coming in pericardial adipose tissue, not epicardial adipose tissue, because there's so much more. Mm -hmm. Very impress impressive reduction in pericardiac uh, adipose tissue. And uh, as it turned out, the, the change in LV mass correlated with the, the change in body weight. So uh, the more body weight that uh, uh, fell, the more LV mass uh, uh, fell. It also uh, tended to correlate with changes in, in waist circumference and, and systolic blood pressure. Uh, the the LV mass change also correlated with changes in LV end diastolic and left atrial end diastolic and end systolic volume. So as LV mass falls, uh, LV and LA volumes fall. So this is likely uh, very much a part and parcel of the benefit of tercepatide in HFPEF. There's uh, reduction in pericardial uh, uh, fat, reduction in adipocytokines, there's a reduction in LV mass, improvement in diastolic uh, function, not shown in our CMR sub study, but shown in the STEP HFPEF ECHO sub study. Uh, 
uh, and resultant reduction in LV volumes, left atrial volume. So uh, this is probably part and parcel of the pathophysiology of how uh, terceptide works in uh, obesity-related hepha. I mean, that's an that's an excellent summary. And I think, you know, one of the things that is um, <clears throat> very apparent from both this study and, as you mentioned, the um, step hefpaf echo sub study is that these agents are not just weight loss agents or anti-obesity agents. These are disease modifying uh, agents with heart failure benefit that kind of squarely fall into the realm of cardiologists. You mentioned briefly the the um, step hefpaf echo sub study that we were Again, very excited to publish from Dr. Solomon and co-authors um, relatively recently. <clears throat> Could you put into context how your results were similar or different? Obviously, that was a different study, so it was with semaglutide up to 2.4 milligrams rather than terzepatide, so that was purely a GLP-1 receptor agonist. And the study in the context of the step hefpef trial used um, echocardiography rather than MR, but found some some different results in that there wasn't, um, you know, a, a, an effect on LV remodeling in that study, but there were changes in left atrial volume, left ventricular diastolic function, RV size. Um, and you, you, you have a nice discussion of this in, in your paper, but wondering if you could kind of put into context some of the similarities and differences between the two studies. Yeah, so if you look uh, at the the step hef, hef echo substudy, it was an excellent uh, study. There were three or four times more patients in that substudy than in in our CMR substudy. You know, echo uh, obviously an excellent technique, but it's it, for measuring uh, LV and LA size and and function. It's it's less reproducible uh, than CMR. So that it did not there did not see a change in LV mass in that. A study. Uh, now, that may be because semaglutide doesn't reduce LV mass, but it also may be because ECHO is just less sensitive to a 10% change in LV mass just because of the limitations of the, the measurement from a, a parasternal, you know, a 2D uh, estimate of wall thickness, whereas we're, with CMR, getting a three-dimensional comprehensive measure of every piece of muscle and truly measuring, L it's really the gold standard for measuring LV mass. So CMR is a much more accurate and reproducible technique for measuring LV mass. For LA volumes, as it turned out, if you know you look under the hood, what semaglutide did is reduce the increase in LA volume over mm -hmm. time. There was a, uh, in the placebo group, it increased, I think, by 12 cc's and maybe by six in the in the treated group. So it wasn't actually associated with reduction in LA volume. Mm -hmm. reduction in the LA volume related to placebo. In the, the CMR sub-study, uh, the, there was a placebo-corrected reduction in LA volume that was not statistically significant. It was about minus 2 cc. So there was no increase. In fact, there was a slight decrease in LA volume with terzepatide. So there's another difference. Now, we they showed uh, changes in diastolic function that we did not measure in the CMR sub-study with terzepatide. Uh, we have not, as of yet, measured RV volumes and function. We hope to, uh, to, to understand how terzepatide affects uh, uh, RV size and function. Wonderful. Well, I mean, it's very clear that um, this is an extremely exciting um, analysis from the summit trial that really helps us understand what is going on and why we're seeing these amazing benefits from agents like terzepatide. So uh, thank you so much. If there's anything else you'd like to add, please go ahead. And we're very grateful for your time today. No, I think we've uh, done a nice uh, job uh, summarizing the the findings, and uh, we think it's a very exciting study, and we're very pleased to publish, have it published in January. Thank you so much.